Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Big Blend Radio. Our today's special guest is Trudy Truitt. She is the author of all the narratives for the National Geographic Kids Explore Academy series, and we love this series. In fact, uh, we did our first interview on the first book in the series. It was called The Nebula mm-hmm. Secret. It was. It still is. It's still out there. You can get it. You can get it. Uh, there's five books, and uh, we interviewed marine biologists David Gruber and Becky Baines, who is the vice president of National Geographic Kids. Uh, so we talked about them. It was initiating this whole series. Uh, very exciting. The series follows the adventures of young Cruz and his friends who attend an elite school where they study to become world-class explorers. I mean, who didn't want to be a, an explorer as a kid? I still want to be an explorer. Do you want to be one, Nancy? Well, we are. I think we are. Yeah. We're, you know, going we from state well, to state to full see what's up. Yeah. Yeah, so they're, we're explorers, I suppose. But this is, for kids, I think this is exciting for them to start thinking about the environment and nature. And then what's also cool about these books is mm-hmm. they bring science and the environment together and nature. It's all combined. The latest book in the series is called The Tiger's Nest. And uh, it goes, it's an underwater world. It's very cool. So it's anyway, cool. let's bring Trudy on. Uh, welcome, Trudy. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Uh, appreciate you having me on today. Hey, I know. It's like when I saw it, I, I was saying this earlier before we started recording. I'm like, I know her name. I know. And then I'm like, yes, we've done this. We did the first in the series. But um, I know that what came out like at the end of 2018, early 2019, the first one, mm-hmm. The Nebula Secret. And now here we are, January 2021, and you're on the fifth book. You guys are yeah. rolling. Yeah, wow. we're rolling along. Yeah, it's yeah. it's been a great fun for me, really. Um, I've really enjoyed um, doing the series. And when I started, I thought, gosh, I sure hope I have enough. You know, I could do enough for seven books. I hope there's enough. I'd, and now I realize I have more than I could ever possibly want. There's just so much to mm. be done in exploration and science and technology. So cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. this is interesting, too. We We've recently interviewed... Uh, Glenn McClure, and then Michelle Schwengel Regala. She she's an artist, a science artist, and she does fiber art. And then he's a composer. Mm. And both of them um, went out with the National Science Foundation to the Arctic. And uh, so they're documenting science through art and interpreting the stories of science and through the Arctic. And there's an artist writers collective that they do. And we were talking about this whole thing about science and the importance because you hear Mm -hmm. the word science and I think sometimes it's scary um, Mm -hmm. because it's like oh I've got to learn things that like math and all of that and then at the same time you've got to realize there's technology in science and that really plays a huge role in research right so um, Mm -hmm. in this book in particular you get all you get into all kinds of stuff with science and you know Mm -hmm. wristbands that monitor your heart we have those you know but there's all of these Mm -hmm. new things so I mean, are you constantly geeking out on technology and, and you have to have that open mind to do it too? Yeah. I mean, I am a huge, I'm a huge Star Trek fan and have been since I was a kid. So, you know, like I wanted to know why, you know, how did Dr. McCoy's tricorder work and Mm -hmm. could I have one? And, but, but for some reason that didn't gel with me when I would read, when, when I would go to school and read a science textbook, I didn't see how you could get from one to the other. Because I was never a great, I mean, I can't say that I was a great scientist in school. I was a good student. But, you know, I thought, oh, I need a lot of math. I need, it's Mm -hmm. kind of dry. It's sort of boring. Mm -hmm. You know, we're doing, you know, lab experiments. And what you realize is that science is anything but boring. Um, When you learn about some of the National Geographic explorers that are out there, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're out there exploring under the ocean and they're looking at glaciers and they're studying coral reefs and they're helping with sea turtle conservation. Mm -hmm. And it just, when I, when I started researching this, I, I just went, oh, wow, this is um, so much more than I ever thought it was. And I can see where now that the passions that I had as a kid for animals and nature would have really I would have been a, a great fit for me as a scientist and that's what I want to do for kids kind of show them mm. that too yeah well, 
especially, you know, in today's world, some people are like, oh, is there really such a thing as science? Suddenly, I don't know why that's happening. You know, it's kind of mm-hmm. been there all along, and we've used it in, in medicine. You know, you mm-hmm. can't. So, you know, if, I remember just freaking out at the idea that they could put something inside your body to make your heart still tick. That just yeah. freaks me out. It's like, dude. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like artificial valves and and yeah, yeah, I mean, just the amazing things that we do with medicine is is it's It's yeah, it's cool, it's it's astonishing. And um, one of the explorers who went on a book tour with me, Zoltan, um, he's quite a character. He's like the Indiana Jones of of um, of herpetology, really. He 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 goes out and um, he gets snake venom, spider Mm -hmm. venom. All the venoms of uh, all the toxic animals that you, uh, and then he bring he brings them here. I know um, he brings them home, and then he makes them available to um, companies who are making medications for humans. So um, we have toxins in diabetes medication, heart medication. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. You know, um, so it was it's interesting. I you know I did a little tour with Zoltan, and we went out, and you know, I, so I would talk to kids about the book, and he would talk about snakes, and and he would show he would show slides and videos. Of, of you know mm-hmm. catching this giant python thing and oh, and gosh. and the, I I mean I was just, wow that's you know but but one thing I did learn from him is that the explorers don't are, they're not they're they're interested in nature and they like living on the edge a little bit but they're not mm-hmm. reckless and they're not careless yeah. what what they're doing in science they're well trained they know what they're doing they have the research they have the schooling they have the background. Um, so that they're not just out there for kicks. They're they're you know doing. Mm. They're not adventurers work. necessarily. No, they're not really. I mean, we use the term adventure, and um, yeah. But the, but the truth is, is they're you know they're definitely they're a professional in in their line of work, just like you and I are professionals in ours. Um, mm. And that's what that's what struck me that you could you could take your passion for you know nature and being out outdoors and be a herpetologist and and do what Zoltan does without, you know, you're not, he's not out there just for the fun and thrills. Um, Although he had a lot of fun and thrills, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) but, but it's really out there to advance science and to contribute, make a difference. Isn't that, you know, kind of what we are all seeking is how do we contribute um, to Mm -hmm. the world? What do we have that, you know, and what do we love and what do we love to protect? And that's Mm -hmm. the thing that, you know, I think um, really hit home for me as I was writing this series is it's not just what do we love, but what do we care about and what are we willing to do to protect that? I think it's really exciting because it's so multifaceted. Yes, there's adventure mm-hmm. in it. And if you don't have that little element of like, yee, and the hairs go up at the back of your neck, <laughs> excitement, that adrenaline, you yeah. may not keep going forward. And, and that joy can come from everything. It could be from seeing one snake that you're really fascinated with or you know, sharks or whatever it is that you're monitoring. But all of these animals, like snakes are very important to our environment, as are sharks. Mm -hmm. You know, they're an Mm -hmm. apex species. And so what I really enjoy is that you are taking, okay, where where there's research involved, but also where science is going um, in regards to actually not harming in the research process. Like for example, like when we go to mm-hmm. parks and public lands and document them and try to connect people and their communities to their parks, whether it's a national park or a tiny community park that has a monarch butterfly garden or something like that to, to get people mm-hmm. to understand that. But like we've gone back and you, Nancy and I've had this conversation for years. It's like, okay, if you try to get up too close to the animal, now you've disturbed mm-hmm. their habitat. You've scared yeah. the animal when you're trying to photograph right. them. Right. But mm-hmm. now we have Zoom lenses and telephoto lenses that we do. We can still view, still be there, have that adventure, but we're not hurting the animal in the process. Right. And I think right. that's and something really big about what you've been writing in in this whole series. Well, and that and that's a really you know that's a really important thing too because it's interesting that you say that. The one of the first questions that the students would ask Zoltan was, "Are you hurting the snake?" You know, when you're mm-hmm. when you're. You know, and he's like, no, 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 it's okay. He makes more venom. I hold him for a minute. I let him go. Um, but, you know, we have those kinds of conversations here in Seattle where I live um, with whale watching sh- uh, boats uh, mm-hmm. in, Pu- in Puget Sound. So we have yeah. orcas that pass through Puget Sound, and people want to see, you know, mm-hmm. so the boats get a little too close. And right. there is, you know, there is conflict between, um, you know, it, 
uh, research, some are research vessels. Most of the research vessels tend to stay their distance and keep their distance. But, you know, you want to nurture this love of animals because people, and especially kids, are very curious about them. But how do you do that in a, in a safe manner for them? And so you're exactly right when, when you say, you know, technology, one of the ways that you can monitor whale populations and migrations is by using drones. So you don't mm-hmm. have to be right there on top of them. Um, mm-hmm. And you can use, you know, um, and you're in a long-distance lenses and uh, submersible machines that don't get too close to, to animals. But, yeah, I think it's really important to um, to emphasize that, you know, uh, the the importance of respecting nature. Yeah, and and also citizen science, this is something, too. I, I love what National Geographic does, number one. It brings – it gets you excited to understand there's so much like – how – big our world is the universe is fascinating and there's always something new to discover one person will never be able to encounter all of it but national geographic tries really hard to get us there and one of the um the, i just think like kids getting involved when they read books like this you've got this adventure element the graphics are awesome the re- it reads like you're in it it's like ooh and it's getting kids to understand that you you're not you're not a nerd or a geek if you're no. into science, you know what I mean? It's, so you, no. it's like you're giving them confidence and pride and uh, through the characters, and also they're going through ups and downs, you know, winning, losing, all of that stuff that kids have to learn, decision-making, all of it. But I think these stories, too, and I want you to kind of give an overview of the tiger's nest, but will help kids get involved with citizen science. Um, I know National Geographic's partnered up with that iNaturalist.org. I know they're part of that. Um, mm-hmm. And it's right. a seek. You've got it on your phone where you can document species and you get, and I'm addicted to it. And I learned about it at an actual nature academy for kids. And I'm like, dude, I'm in. <laughs> I'm geeked out. I, but it's I'm cool. Pathetic. But yeah, it's cool. cool. So yeah. yes, we have these tools that they can read your book, think about where they're going to go in the future, especially for teens and young teens where they're going to go Mm -hmm. in the future, what they want to study, but they can start doing it now with the tools that are out there. Right. And Mm -hmm. that's the beauty of it is that um, I think it's important for kids to understand that, um, that they have a voice, that voice is important, that um, they can get involved, that they should get involved. And in fact, sometimes we as adults um, tend to make excuses for doing things or not doing things, or a kid, kids will see a need and they'll just do it. They see a park that needs cleaning up, they're just going to do it. You know, they 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 <laughs> we we tend to make excuses and and kids get involved. And so one of the things that I was always looking for as I wrote this was how could get, kids get involved? And whenever I saw something that I thought that they might like, I tried to incorporate it in the book. And a good example of that is in in um one of the previous books the kids learn about looting and um I shared some actual technology where um, scientists and um, Egyptologists are using satellite photos to find looting spots in um, in Egypt, primarily. Um, cool. And you can tell you you can tell you can see by the by the way that the holes have dug <laughs> in the satellite image, you can tell where there are looting spots because they're just like perfectly round holes, which nature wouldn't have. So. There was a, hmm. um, a website um, connected with that that I put in the back of the book where kids could go and you could help look for looting sites. So I, I'm always trying to find ways that kids can get involved and, and, and you know, be part of that because they, they should be. It's not – it's their world. I mean, it's really hmm. their world. The future is, is in their hands. Hmm. I love that. I remember as a kid going to the at the end of the pier in Santa Monica, they had what they called a diving belt, mm. and they would you, you as a kid, I used to go there like at least once or twice a year and beg my parents, my brother and I were like, "No, come on, we go and do the diving belt, and you get in and it's the coolest thing you felt like you're going in outer space, you lowered <laughs> down to the bottom of the ocean. And there's fish all over the place. And it was just so like, wow, this is magical, magical. And instead yeah. of them being in a fish tank, you're right. in the fish tank. And, and right. you can see. And then when a shark does go by, you're like, whoa, dude, dude. <laughs> <It's> really exciting. <laughs> and then that later led me to go snorkeling in the Indian Ocean in Kenya. Because mm-hmm. that's a wow. that's a place where you can see these, these beautiful fish. 
Right. And even more tropical because the water is so much warmer than in the States, at least um, at the end of the pier in Santa Monica. That was cold. And, and you know what? You learned about the sharks. I mean, I, I, yeah. I as a yeah. kid snorkeled and there would be tigers, sharks at the bottom. Mm-hmm. And they really yeah. left you alone. And you understood this harmony in the ocean from that of oh, watch out for the urchins because, mm-hmm. you, you know, you'd have to wear if you're wearing slippers, you can wear them, but you really, at the end of the day, ended up having to learn how to really be strong and wear, uh, I'm going to say tackies because now I'm in a different country in my head. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what do you call them? Sneakers here. Sneakers. And it's because if you landed, if you stood up, because the, the reef, would, the water would go down and you could walk through the reef at low tide, which is crazy, you wow. know, or go on a glass bottom boat, or but it's that Indian Ocean, which... Let's just talk. That brings us to Tiger's Nest, right? So, uh, your characters uh, in the Tiger's Nest know all about the Indian Ocean in this book. Right, right, and they learn about things that, I mean, there, there are what I consider sort of popular topics. So things that we more are more interested in, um, like sea turtle conservation, and right. you know those the, those kind of things that we hear about. But then there are things that we don't hear about, like species. Um, in the in the book, they learn a little bit about the sheath-tailed bat which is a species that is only um, found um, in the Seychelles. And so, mm-hmm. and they're, and they're, you know, they're sort of starting to see that uh, extinction and species th- is something that, you know, we hear about the popular animals, we hear about, you know, the polar bears, and that's great, uh, but there are other animals that we're losing that we're right. not paying att- we're not paying attention to the whole entire ecosystem. And what's kind of funny too is also in the book they they learn about habitat reforestation and mm. and um and and they learn about invasive species, which is not to kids a really exciting topic and they're not happy about it. I mean, they're, <laughs> they 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 get they get a project they de- don't really want to work on. It's habitat reforestation. They're pulling out. They're pulling out weeds. <laughs> they're like, yeah. this is not what we thought. Um, they're, you know, and they're a little disappointed because they're thinking, yeah. I thought we were going to do something cool and with the turtles, and here we are pulling weeds. But that's part of understanding our climate is understanding all of the problems and all of the mm-hmm. things that we face as a planet. Um, and then they they slowly begin to realize that it makes a difference. One drop in the ocean makes a difference. What they're doing um, could could completely restore a habitat and restore the animals that live in that habitat. And then all of a sudden that becomes, oh, I get it. I understand now. Um, so those are some of the things that, you know, I think – that we even as adults we don't really we don't really grasp we just look at one piece of it. Yeah, then that, that's what I think you've done so well in these books is that it does bring like I said it's multifaceted which keeps your brain moving on so you don't have to you know stick in the reforestation part for ten years you know it's like okay I'm gonna have to learn about this <laughs> but I get to move on from there which I think is is really cool. Um, it's interesting the reforestation part. I mean there, there's so much going on in the world with that and. Uh, you, what Nancy, you were telling me about was it Thailand with the buses underwater or something for the coral? Oh yeah, oh. they they were oh, pushing yeah. old vehicles off the pier and letting them sink to the bottom, and, oh. the, and and coral reefs would start to grow and cover up the vehicles and make mm-hmm. habitat. And I don't know where they're um, why they thought cars were the thing to drop in there, but. And maybe what what went missing that the coral reef wasn't the coral wasn't mm-hmm. able to to latch on to anything, mm-hmm. but they found a sort of a solution. You know, I don't know how good if it will be ten, fifteen, twenty years from now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think the cars would rust away. Yeah, I think, yeah but I'm not of, sure. And, well, yeah. and I, I know they do. They will occasionally do that with boats, with old boats once they've mm-hmm. you know stripped it of ha- hazardous materials and. Yeah. chemicals and what have you they'll use a boat as a coral reef but yeah i mean and that's mm. a good ex- example too they they learn about coral farming um mm. unfortunately again it's not a project chris's team gets which they're really bummed about <laughs> but it's you know it's um yeah you know i think that it's an if we can kind of give these kids to- kids topics that they can latch on to um they will pick out the topics that are interesting to them and learn more about them Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what I found from readers. So, like, if you have a if you have a reader that is kind of interested in bats or turtles or coral reefs, they will latch onto that and 
look for other nonfiction books on the topic. Um, I know I noticed that as a nonfiction writer that I would write books about animals and uh, earth science and weather for kids. And if if a child found a topic that interested them, like let's say they love volcanoes, they would read every book possible that they could mm-hmm. find on volcanoes. Um, and so a lot of times they become more knowledgeable than you do <laughs> about the topic when you talk to them about it. But that's, that's, that's what cool. kids are. They're just, they're just sponges when they you know mm-hmm. find topics that fascinate them. And I think that's what triggers um, their love of not just reading, but their love of, of nature and, and the planet and protecting the planet. And mm-hmm. one thing I noticed – Go ahead. Yeah, one thing I've noticed about all the explorers that I've talked to, and I've talked to a lot of them now, um, is that almost all of them found something they loved to do as a child and made that into their career. I mean, yeah. they they exactly. they might not have been That's, they might not have been the best student in school. They might not have even been very good at school, but they knew they loved hiking. You know, they knew they loved camping. They knew they loved. Yeah. You know, um, uh, one of the um, glaciologists on the on the explorer website her name is m jackson and she studies glaciers and ice melt and she says i know it's kind of a weird thing to do but i have always loved snow i've always loved ice (laughs) and she wasn't a great student but you know she found her passion she found something that she loved yeah you're always better at something that you like as opposed to something you really don't like you know Mm -hmm. or you talk yourself into that you think you you think you would like oh i think i would like this um mm. but if you go back to your roots and just think about what did you what did you love to do when you were nine ten years old you know was it cooking photography hiking being outdoors mm-hmm. whatever that was whatever that was in your heart at nine or ten is likely going to be something that satisfies you at 20 and 30 and 40 and 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 as you mm-hmm. as you get older and if you can make a career out of that because um, that mm-hmm. was you know that was me i was writing when I was, you know, seven, eight years old, um, mm. you know, and, writing and stories and har- harassing my teachers about, could you, you know, could I read my story? <laughs> well, now she's got, what, well, over 100 books under your belt. I mean, that's a lot. Wow. I mean, 100 books is not something to sneeze at. That's incredible. No, that shows she's got passion, <laughs> you know. I've been doing it for a while, yeah, yeah. And and that's, the, but even as a writer, you know, one of the great things about that is you you get to change direction. So it's never it, – people always say, well, are you kind of bored? But it's never boring if you're mm-hmm. um, always challenging yourself with something new and different, learning something new. Um, then I find – you know, I've had a lot of incarnations. I've done – you know, originally I started nonfiction library, and I love that. Um, then I kind of moved over and did just fiction for a bit. Uh, then this is sort of something in between, nonfiction and fiction. Cool. So I think that's – you know, it's like any job. You you look for the new challenge. Um mm. And that's what keeps yeah. it interesting and fun. Yeah. Well, you have to explore all avenues. You know, we got a, a press release a few days ago about young rap stars in Kenya raising funds for to help with their deforestation problem. And ah. then, yeah, and the, uh, they're making money out there, and they, they realize, they said de- deforestation is the second largest contributor to the climate yep. crisis. Yep. So they're... they're the kids in Kenya are raising money by by doing rap songs and singing, and because it's rap, the kids are going to listen to it, and they're they're going to already know before they're adults what to do about climate change and that it is real, it isn't a myth, and that they have to they have to be ready for it. They right, have to be ready right. to help save. So I, I mean, it's it's great, you know, that people, the younger people, are are picking things up and going for it and doing things. And, and understanding, mm-hmm. actually mm-hmm. understand the problem, which, you know, sometimes it took a long time for people to understand, like, even that the earth was round and that everything's yeah. connected and that a climate don't change over me on years, that. You know, I'm <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, you know, so, <laughs> like, if something happens on this side of the earth, it's going to have, um, you know, some effect on the other side of the earth. Because the earth it's is round. Well. Yes, and because it's connected. The other earth is round. Hello. And and also sometimes you don't know, you you don't understand the ramifications because I can remember when we – when we learned that the temperature, the earth's temperature was rising like one degree. Well, what does that mean? So what? You know, I don't see a problem. (laughs) Oh boy, that's a lot. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, you have to kind of you have to under you have to go a little deeper for for people and show the ramifications of what that means. And mm. once I think uh, kids are very um, astute on that. They, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know why adults seem to be questioning the science. The kids really, the kids that I at least the ones that I connect with, they really don't. They're very educated, um, and they recognize that you know we're running out of time to fix some of the problems. Oh. I think that we're dealing I with. think with adults it is really a form of, of denial. Mm. They they first of all they don't want to admit that the responsibility has been here and they didn't address it, um, mm. or they really didn't know what to do, so they turn their attention elsewhere. But there, mm. there's I think it's a form of denial because mm. if you keep telling yourself it's not true, you don't have to do anything about it. But mm-hmm. but this is where the role of kids come in too because. I know when we we did um, a series of coloring in books uh, for kids to raise money for various environmental and uh, wildlife and pet organizations and um, pet rescue. And I mean, we've done this in South Africa and then we did it here. And so you put in the coloring book and you had sponsors for it. So the printing was paid for and we'd sell the books and these kids, they were pictures that were connected to their community. So if there was an ocean, it would have the ocean, it would have a museum, maybe the, the, I remember the last one had a wagon that was at a museum. These kids would color in and take these pictures to their parents and beg to go to these museums. To the now, when does that happen? You know? Wow. So it's like, yeah. I know kids, when they're excited about something, they become mm-hmm. the biggest nags. And I mean that in a positive way. And mm-hmm. when they are passionate, like you're saying, they'll tell you about stuff. And it, to me, it's exciting when a child knows something you don't know because that gives them that other, like, hey, I know something. That feels yeah. a bit of confidence <laughs> that they need more to keep going forward. And it's yeah. okay to not know everything the kids know. I mean, I think parents right now are in a bind because it's like suddenly the kids are home. They're not at home, in, out, whatever's going on with COVID, right? right. And suddenly it's like, you remember trigonometry? Oh, heck. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. 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 And don't make kids know more. So I think books like this also right now are crucial to what's going on. I mean, there's homeschooling parents who've been doing this and know about it, have an organization to back them up. But then there's, and I think these are for homeschoolers for sure, but there's also the kids, then the parents going, now what? Oopsie. And books like this really help. And the kids get to be excited and the parents learn. So like what Nancy's saying with the denial, parents are going to start reading and learning from their kids, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think that... You you want to ultimately you want to make it enjoyable and exciting for them to read because sure. again you know I want a dry book I want a dry textbook kind of thing um, you make that you, they will they will glean onto things that you know that that are that are fascinating to them uh, and then want to know more about it and that's the you know that's the hope that there's a catalyst mm-hmm. there that they might yeah you know they like the book and they have a good time and they enjoy cruise and they're excited and it's a good adventure but if you learn a few things along the way and you're um and maybe you're sparked to learn more then you know i think that um i'm my my work here is done you know mm-hmm. yeah yeah and and you know because the writing is it you're right in it you know what's going on with the kids and number yeah. one the fact that there's an explorer academy is super cool too just saying um yeah <laughs> I mean, that's the whole thing too um, and I also like that there are girls in there, you know, doing yeah. science stuff because we forget that a lot. Um, so I oh, love yeah. that part of it. And the other thing is, you know, these are out there, they're tools, but you've got the, I think the illustrations are just, they they move. They make everything just jump on the page. And I think yeah. all ages appreciate that. We all want yeah, pictures. Yeah, I, I think. They, you know, did a super, super good job. Scott Plum is the illustrator for the interior art, and I just think he does an amazing job. Um, and and the full color illustrations um, are fantastic. I, you know, have never seen anything like that in a book. Certainly, um, not anything I've ever done. Yeah. So it's really just, you know, really. Um, and again, that's another thing to add, you know, to complement it because there's a lot of words on a page, and so if you do have a reader who is a little hesitant about mm-hmm. reading or finds it challenging, you've got visuals there and that kind of keeps them stimulated. Plus in the illustrations there are um codes and puzzles and secret little mm-hmm. messages hidden for them to to find. So again, that's just one more element of fun. And that's what Yeah, and know, that makes it interactive. It. 
That makes exactly, it interactive. Yeah. And and then, yeah. then they're actually working on something. So they, again, that confidence in, in studying. I just feel like there's always got to be this confidence through studying. Like learning's got mm-hmm. to be fun and you guys are doing awesome. So I want to know what your office looks like. Do you have pictures of, you know, whales? <laughs> and like, you, I mean, I, I mean, are you, I'd be a hundred books and then you're doing this kind of thing, which to me, it's like, I would, I would be down every rabbit hole in the planet of like science and nature and I'd be geeking out all the time and then have to go, Oh, Oh, I got to go right. Oopsie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, so, yeah, it's yeah, a little what's challenging. Like? I mean, <laughs> uh, my, I, my, I try to keep my office pretty organized. I actually have my, I have a cat that takes up most of my desk. So she's like cool. kind of pushed out <laughs> all of my books to one side. I, yeah, I have cats. I on love the desk, how yeah. they do that. Um, you know, I, you know, I don't know, but she's got a good a good chunk of the desk. Um, mm, but cool. but I try to keep my office pretty pretty neat pretty neat, Cause just because I am kind of an, a neat organized person, and it's hard to work in in clutter. Uh, but I have a lot of books, of course. Um, so I have a good you know big size bookcase, and then I have um, interesting. I have canvas prints. So you know the big can, you know canvas size prints like 20 by mm-hmm. 30 prints of of some of my different book covers that my husband has done for me oh. so I get I'm sort of surrounded by different book covers of different books um so that's inspiring and kind of nice kind of fun for me to to see that when I look at when I look awesome. about yeah 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 so, one of the things that I yeah. really found different about this book is the idea that you would have a, a photograph and then put the drawings of, of the kids in Oh yeah, and, yeah. I've never seen yeah, that either. No, but I looked at. I'm like, man. I, I think it's a that, that's cool. Yeah, I think it's a great idea to be able to take. Um, now some of the illustrations are just straight art, um, and yeah. some Scott has painted uh, the art. He's actually painted on the photograph, so you get. So you, you wow. know, there is that feeling of again trying to paint that picture of of a realistic world, and by using photographs, and also you know if you go through some of the books, you see which um, the art director has chosen to use as photographs, oftentimes it's like a pangolin or some kind of animal mm-hmm. that you want to see what it looks like in the wild. Um, mm-hmm. And you can do that because there it is. Um, so I like that I like that they've chosen uh, um, like the monarch butterflies and the pangolins and um, the gorillas, the mountain gorillas are there. But then there's also, but then um, there's a, you know, a right whale, giant picture of a right whale in, in one, a photograph of a right whale. And Cruz is, is swimming beside the whale. Um, when in fact there was actually a diver that was really there, so they took out the diver <laughs> and cool. put in Cruz. <laughs> hey, why not? <laughs> so that was kind of that was pretty fun. Uh, but I That's like that good. too. It's again, it's just that whole marriage of, of you know realism and fantasy. Yeah, cool. awesome. Well, yeah, because that makes you, you know, and that's the other thing is to spark the imagination. That's the other huge right. part of this because not only is the the exploring, the researching, you know, and the science, but it may for the the youth you know who are reading this to become an inventor of some of these scientific things that we need exactly. to use these, these geeky things maybe you know they created they're the inventor of 7D printing <laughs> you know we got 3D 4D printing I mean they're making right. meat out of it like like new like vegetarian meat through <laughs> printing I mean like what how did that happen so I, I never know. know what is that yes I mean and, and it's going so fast um that just you know, we're, we can't even keep keep up with what science is doing. It's amazing. I know. And you know, you talk about coral farming. I actually have a friend who grows coral for fish. Oh, there you go. Wow. And I was sitting there going, I didn't even know. Like, I, I go and the coral every day. Yeah. And it's yeah. cool. Nancy Misha, the guitarist, Misha, Misha oh. Shellhoff, grows wow. coral. And so, yep. but but I I huh. I do it. It's kind of meditative to just go and look at the fish in the coral every morning. And I'm like, hello. <laughs> Hello to the coral. And there's all these different species of coral that you just don't, you always think coral and kelp, but each, you know, it's like a whole other, you know, it's like learning all the different fungi and lichens and all, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just a yeah. trip to me to, yeah. to get to and know. Thank, so I'm and glad thank goodness it, you know. we're doing that. Yeah. Because we're, mm-hmm. you know, our coral reef situation is not good. So, no, it isn't. um, you know, the, the coral nurseries and the, we're learning more all the time about coral farming and how to, you know, um, to restore and hopefully how to protect what we have too, so that we don't have to keep doing this to restore damaged yeah. coral reefs. You know. But, yeah. Because yeah. we're playing. Yeah, we're. It's kind of like we're playing fake nature, but yet at the same time, mm-hmm. it's needed, and we have. You know what I mean? It's like. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. until we can reverse what we've done, because, I mean, we're, we're getting hotter as a planet. That's why the coral mm-hmm. telling us the something. Coral's stressing. Like, hey, yep. Yeah. It's like, and, hello, and, people. And people don't understand. Then we have these huge, you know, blizzards and snowstorms and extra hurricanes and things. So when it happens, they go, oh, global warming, climate change. That's why I think we even have the term climate change is, you know, mm-hmm. we get colder. As the earth gets hotter, we get colder as well. And right, so we're, right. we're, and we're pushing it into this bipolar opposite thing. It's either hot or right. cold, and we're going to miss our in, our middle seasons, you know? Right, and that's the trouble with the coral reefs, too, is that it's not just the warmer temperatures. It's colder, too. It's it's, mm-hmm. it's stress. It's stress yeah. on the on the animal. And, yeah, or, you know, how do you, once you've lost that balance, can you get it back? Yeah. Mm. Wow, wow. Well, it's such a pleasure having you on the on the show, Trudy. Uh, Trudy, do you have a website that people can follow you? Because you're cool. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. Uh, my website is Trudy, T-R-U-D-I, Truitt, T-R-U-E-I-T, dot com. Awesome. And okay. everyone, um, there's five books out there, uh, all through National Geographic Kids Books, and you can go to kids.nationalgeographic.com. It's on Amazon. Everywhere you get books, you can get these five books. And um, I'd say get all five, man. Geek out. <laughs> Have a party. <laughs> it's super cool. And especially now, like I was saying, with you know, everyone's situation is different. Um, and you know, also, I, I hope all libraries get these too for kids um, that need them oh, as well. Oh, thank that you way. so much. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. And we're gonna close with a song. We always love to pair music up. And today we want to go uh, on on the bay. This is a song I from one of my favorite <laughs> bands, Walkabout Band. We have to. Um, you know, know, they love the ocean, and this is a collaboration uh, with musicians between Sydney, Australia, I might get it wrong, but Australia and America and, and Long Beach uh, in uh, New York. So it's pretty cool. The Indian Ocean is part of it, too, so that kind of ties in. Uh, but here it is, On the Bay. It's from the very first album by the Walkabouts and uh, you can band.com. So here it is, On the Bay. Take care, Trudy. Thanks. Trudy. Thank you. Can that's all.